Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the Wilson Center this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, today's meeting is entitled Linking Security and Development in State Building, Recent Lessons from Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the director of the Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity, Ambassador Howard Wolpe, is unable to be with us this morning. He's currently traveling in Africa, and consequently, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the Wilson Center. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the center, it was established by an act of Congress in 1968 and uh, is the nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. As both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a doctorate, and a national leader, Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policy policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. Aiming to bridge the gap between the world of ideas and the world of policy, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan institute for advanced study and a neutral forum for open, serious, and informed dialogue. So we welcome you today. Michael Lund, on my left, is the Consulting Program Manager to the Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity. Uh, some of our project materials are out on the, um, on the table outside. Michael is also the Senior Specialist for Conflict and Peace Building at Management Systems International Incorporated, and he is today's moderator. So at this point, I'd like to turn the panel over to him. Thank you. Thanks, Georgina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Coincidentally, uh, you may have heard the news from Bagram Air Force Base, which certainly puts in sharp relief our topic today, although we're going to probe a little more deeply into it than the, uh, you get perhaps in the, the headline stories. Um, this is the third in a series of forums we've had on the theme, what really works in preventing and rebuilding uh, failed states. A little bit of gall there in using this notion of really works, uh, but our purpose is to get beyond the usual kind of uh, discourse and uh, to some extent the common kind of forum in Washington which typically uh, seems sometimes to kind of hawk one particular approach or another in a sort of a policy bazaar. Uh, without really probing deeply into um, the evidence as to what kinds of approaches uh, are effective in the field in improving the lives uh, both in security and development terms of the people in the countries that are affected by U.S. and, and other uh, programs and interventions. Uh, so we're trying to take a critical look at the evidence in each of these forums uh, on whatever focus that we've adopted. The last two uh, uh, forums in this series have picked up on this theme of the need for coherent uh, so-called holistic comprehensive strategies in both uh, post-conflict situations and or in s countries that are prone to conflict but have not uh, escalated or broken out into violent conflict. Uh, the reports on those sessions are available um, on, the t on the table outside. So the approach we're t talking about here, um, again, in this forum is to try to get away from the usual stovepiped, sectorally organized, uh, one by one approach to uh, post-conflict peace building uh, in which uh, rule of law, refugees, IDPs, humanitarian assistance, education, health, democracy building, elections, security, all of the various uh, instruments, uh, programmatic instruments in the toolbox are carried out by a variety of uh, development agencies uh, and other uh, agencies, uh, domestic and international, and getting to a more um, coherent uh, strategic approach which uh, tries to identify what's, what are the drivers and sources of conflict or potential conflict in a given country, and then a uh, a tailor a strategy, a multifaceted strategy, strategy carried out therefore by a number of actors uh, that addresses each of those short-term as well as long-term and underlying uh, factors. Uh, the Paris Declaration uh, for Aid Harmonization uh, relates to another theme here which is cooperation among the uh, international agencies that are active in, in a given country. The U.S. government's national strategy, a security strategy for 2006, for example, talks about the three Ds, development, uh, uh, de uh, development diplomacy, and uh, defense. 
Uh, one could throw in, the reason I'm a little confused sometimes is that one could also throw in democracy building, which has also, of course, a, been a high priority. Um, and to try to implement such a whole of government, as the UK government would call it, approach, uh, there's been created, as many of you know, the uh, State Department's uh, coordinator for reconstruction and stabilization. But the question here is, uh, is this just the latest uh, policy buzzword uh, that uh, not just our government and other governments, but also in the UN are, are, are being echoed around the halls uh, up in, in the UN Secretariat in, in New York or in Brussels with the European Commission? Obviously, any kind of cooperation you may know from your own experience or collaboration is extremely difficult uh, to achieve among competing NGOs or even competing bu public agencies in this field of development, which is uh, chronically starved for funds. Um, so w among the questions we'd like to look at <clears throat> through the uh, case of the Afghanistan experience is whether such holistic strategies are in fact even being carried out. Uh, to what extent, um, what are the challenges in, in establishing them, but, and then also to the extent that they're carried out, what sorts of effects uh, have they had on moving toward some kind of uh, integrated notion at the goal end of things of security as well as development. One might say this is peace building or sustainable peace, so on, which I assume most of us are ultimately, that's ultimately what we're interested in. Afghanistan is an extremely fitting test case for probing into this theme. Um, if, not a, a frag, if not a failed state, a fragile state, um, and as Candace, one of our speakers, will, will uh, illuminate us more on, uh, has had uh, in the last year and a half or so uh, the, uh, experienced in an effort to uh, bring about a more co comprehensive approach uh, following on the earlier Bonn Agreement in, in establishing procedures and relationships between the Afghanistan government and major and other international agencies uh, through something called the uh, uh, Afghan, Afghanistan National Development Strategy. And at the local level, many of you have heard about the provincial and perhaps know a great deal about the provincial uh, reconstruction teams, which is uh, an effort to integrate security and development through civilian mi military cooperation uh, at, at the uh, community level. Uh, most of the time, uh, one sees this topic addressed, I think, in Washington in terms of, civ quote, civil military relationships, more of an in operational issue in terms of the day-to-day -day interactions between civilian personnel and military personnel and agencies, and therefore the cultural uh, uh, tensions that often have occurred. But we're trying to look at this not only with respect to that on the ground level, but also at the, at the policy level and strategic, strategic and international level. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very uh, accomplished and expert speakers to, to uh, pursue this topic. Uh, uh, I won't uh, go into the, uh, all of the biographical information which is available to you uh, in the flyer which you received when you, you came in. Um, but uh, Candace Karp, our first speaker, uh, is currently the Special Assistant <coughs> to the President of Afghanistan's Senior Economic Advisor who has been, as an individual, very instrumental and active with regard to promoting this strategy I mentioned. Um, and Mark Ward uh, has uh, stepped in uh, for uh, Alonzo Fulgham, who unfortunately, unfortunately has taken uh, ill, cannot appear today. Um, but Mark is uh, coming in uh, at the last minute, and we thank him for that. He is the Senior Deputy Administrator <coughs> Assistant Administrator for the uh, Asia and Near East Bureau at uh, USAID, among other accomplishments, and you, you can read about uh, the, his, his uh, career and awards and so on in that flyer. And then uh, third, we're asking Alexander Thier, who is the uh, rule of, Senior Rule of Law Advisor at the United States Institute of Peace, to, uh, to help us um, uh, try to make some sense out of this whole question of does integrative uh, st security slash development strategies, do they, how, what are the challenges in bringing them about and if, uh, to the extent that one has accomplished them or not, uh, how, how does, uh, what is the evidence that, they, that they, make a, they make a difference? So without further ado, we'll have mm -hmm. 15 minutes uh, from each speaker and then uh, question and answers. Candace.
Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. 2007 has repeatedly been described by commentators as Afghanistan's crucial year. The partnership between the government of Afghanistan and the international community will face several challenges in 2007, not least the insurgency in the south and east of the country. The government of Afghanistan has responded to the insurgency by requesting further donor support to expand the state security apparatus. In lieu of aid disbursements to cover the long-term recurrent costs associated with increasing police and army recruit numbers, a budgetary balancing act will be required to ensure that increased security expenditures do not result in a parallel decrease in resources for rebuilding and sustaining Afghanistan's human and physical capital. Should the government of Afghanistan fail to meet public expectations with regards to service provision, its own legitimacy will be undermined. It is entirely plausible, therefore, that insecurity in the south and east of Afghanistan has the potential to destabilize and undermine the state-building effort throughout the country and reverse the gains made to date should newly created infrastructure fall into a state of disrepair as a result of fiscal pressures on the budget. While fighting the insurgency, the government of Afghanistan must also combat growing public skepticism. Polling data recently gathered by various sources, including the Asia Foundation, the Program on International Policy Attitudes, and the, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, indicates that while Afghans remain committed to the post-Taliban Afghanistan and prefer the status quo over alternatives such as a return to the Taliban, support for President Hamid Karzai and the executive branch of government is decreasing. Impatience with the pace of service provision is one reason for wavering support, and the failure of ministries to spend their development budgets for rebuilding Afghanistan's human and physical capital through service provision is linked to an absence of capacity within line ministries. Corruption and the perception of impunity is another reason for decreased levels of support. There remains no silver bullet for dealing with this challenge, apart from recognizing that the political will of the government must be employed to respond to the expectations of the Afghan public. For all the challenges currently facing the state-building coalition in Afghanistan, the country has progressed remarkably since 2001. To appreciate this fact, one must remember the destruction Afghanistan faced after Soviet occupation, after its own civil war, and after the rule of the Taliban. Afghanistan is not a typical post-conflict country. It's not even post-conflict, not yet. Nonetheless, service provision has commenced. Reconstruction and development in Afghanistan is now pursued within a government-led framework, the Afghanistan National Strategy. The ANDS sits across three pillars, security, governance, rule of law, and human rights, and economic and social development. The ANDS is also linked to the Afghanistan Compact, a series of benchmarks representing the state-building partnership between the government and the international community, and agreed upon at the London Conference in 2006. Preparations to complete the ANDS are underway and include subnational consultations, <coughs> the creation of comprehensive sector strategies, and the completion of a poverty reduction strategy paper, which will identify policies and programs for broad-based growth and poverty reduction. Government-led and endorsed planning mechanisms coordinate and operationalize the ANDS and the Compact by identifying needs, suggesting and endorsing policy prescriptions, and coordinating the development inputs of a wide array of state building actors. These planning mechanisms are found centrally, provincially, and locally. Central mechanisms include the budget and the Joint Coordination and Monitoring Board, which provides policy and political support for the Afghan Compact and also deals with coordination, implementation, and financing issues. At the subnational level of governance, Provincial development committees and local surers identify and prioritize reconstruction and development requirements. Developing the capacity of both will facilitate decentralization of government functions, which is crucial to ensure 
that the government is responsive to the needs of even the most remotely located Afghan. <coughs> the centrality of government to the state building process and the subsequent creation of government led and endorsed planning mechanisms to facilitate reconstruction and development have transformed the civil military environment. Civil military relations in Afghanistan are no longer characterized by the debate pertaining to PRTs and the wisdom of military actors undertaking development activities. Instead, the international military presence is strengthening the process of state building by utilizing sub-national governance mechanisms to identify Afghanistan's development needs. ISAF's regional command, based in Kabul, is a case in point, linking an absence of reconstruction and development with an increased likelihood of instability of instability in a given geographic location, ISAF political advisors and CIMIC teams will identify specific locales requiring development inputs. ISAF's first point of contact in this process is UNAMA, the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. UNAMA is contacted to ascertain whether the provincial development committees have established a list of provincial development priorities. If so, ISAF and UNAMA representatives will determine what has been completed, started, or postponed. If no such activities are planned or are underway, ISAF and UNAMA representatives will determine the most suitable development framework for a specific geographic area. The development framework is undertaken in partnership with the line ministry representatives who are contacted early in the process to ensure sustainability of, of potential projects and to ensure an Afghan face to any project outcomes. ISAF representatives will also dispatch, will, will also contact local NGOs for feedback and dispatch CIMIC teams to obtain a response from local communities who often request additional assistance. Potential projects for a specific locale are classified into separate categories those that can be conducted by ISAF and those requiring donor assistance. Actual ISAF participation in reconstruction and development activities is often determined by existing ISAF technical capacity, such as the availability of engineering platoons. Should donor assistance be required, ISAF representatives will submit a project document to donors. Once a donor expresses interest, ISAF representatives will seek out an implementing partner and develop information campaigns best describing the planned project and intended benefits for the project's recipients. The role of government throughout the process is highlighted to reinforce Afghan ownership. <coughs> development actors within PRTs operate in much the same way. Extending the writ of central government now translates into, de into developing the sub-national state building mechanisms by mentoring, and local, by mentoring local and provincial Afghans to assume responsibility for reconstruction and development. A local shura in eastern Afghanistan may suggest the construction of a school, but representatives from USAID, who are located within all US PRTs, will ensure that, al will ensure that other elements associated with infrastructure development, such as staffing requirements, are considered. Civil military relations have also returned to a more traditional division of labor as a result of the insurgency, which has compelled military actors to reassume their traditional role as security providers. Insecurity has also reinforced the nexus between security and development. In response to the insurgency, the Policy Action Group was created in July 2006 as a crisis management body for the provinces of Kandahar Helmand, Uruzgan, and Zabal. The action group meets weekly, usually under the chairmanship of the National Security Advisor, and highlights priority challenges in the areas of reconstruction and development, <coughs> strategic communication, and intelligence and security operations. Successes to date have included the, complete, the successful completion of polio vaccination campaigns, which were coordinated between military actors and health, services, health service providers to ensure that target areas were free from conflict for the duration of immunization campaigns. The creation of Afghan development zones is another initiative between security and development actors within the PAG structure. That's the policy action group. 
an Afghan development zone identifies strategically important geographic areas where improvements in security and governance will enable development actors to function. The Policy Action Group is credited with increased coordination and cooperation between the government of Afghanistan and the international community. Improved coordination between security and development actors has also occurred. The relationship between international NGOs and military actors remains contentious, even though the relationship between both is crucial for the state building agenda since both operate on the ground to sustain it in complementary ways. Local support for Afghanistan's overarching political process is also dependent upon the conditions created by NGO and military actors. On this basis, the Afghan population will decide whether state building up in Afghanistan is worthy of continued support. NGO attitudes towards their military counterparts range between a willingness to engage and a refusal to do so. NGO representatives <coughs> attempting to explain NGOs' aversion to working with the military cite the twin humanitarian pillars of impartiality and neutrality as key reasons. It can be argued, however, that NGOs leave their impartiality and neutrality at the door once they embark on a highly politicized development agenda which requires operational coordination and cooperation to maximize available resources. Joint op operations between NGOs and military actors do not occur at present, but at the very least, joint operations should be considered, if only to acknowledge the similarity of, of, of objectives that drive state-building actors and the overarching political agenda that even the most apolitical organization is supporting through its very presence in Afghanistan. Joint operations to deliver services in locations without a government presence are a logical way to extend the writ of government while maximizing resources. Joint operations are also a pragmatic response to an insurgency. There is always the danger that refusal to work in tandem with a state-building counterpart creates a perception that a state-building coalition can be splintered. What really works in rebuilding failed states? In the civil-military sphere, coordination and cooperation between civilian and military actors is fundamental. Empowering government and operating through government structures is logical, as is mentoring to build indigenous capacity. The international community should, after all, aim for its own redundancy. Finally, civilian and military actors and the governments that dispatch them must recognize that state building is a generational process. Thank you very much. You can stand or sit, whatever you like. Well, good morning. Um, a pleasure to uh, to be here. I'm sorry Alonzo's not feeling well, but uh, I'm probably not a bad substitute having just returned from Kabul this weekend. Um, clearly the foreign assistance priorities have changed since the Cold War and as our moderator said, Afghanistan is a perfect example. And USAID, the organization that I work for and have for, let's just say, 20 plus years, that would be an inappropriate question, how many exactly, during the Q&A. Um, <laughs> clearly USAID is working in more and more conflict-prone countries and learning how to work side by side with the U.S. military. I've had a lot of experience in this area in disasters, as you might have read, working on the tsunami and the Pakistan earthquake. There's been a realization at the highest levels of our government and most of the governments that we work with um, that development plays a key role in our national security. But, as indicated, when we talk about the three Ds, development alone isn't going to do the trick. We've got, we've got to let the State Department have a role, and we've got to let the military have a role as well. Let me talk a little bit about the current situation in Afghanistan and how USAID is now working with our military, with ISAF, with other donors, and most important, with the Afghan government to choose our priorities. <coughs> But let's step back. Candace said a little bit about how far we've come, but let's 
step back and try to remember how things were um, when we first <coughs> went back to Afghanistan in late 2001. You had a licit economy of about $2.4 billion and no formal banking system. Fewer than a million children in school. No access to basic health care and one of the worst maternal and infant mortality rates in the world. A rural and agriculturally based society with widespread illiteracy and a growing poppy problem. Very few paved roads or other infrastructure and fewer than 6% of the population with access to electricity. Then, suddenly, the country became the focal point for the global war on terror, and U.S. and coalition forces were mobilized to remove the Taliban and destroy the remaining al-Qaeda camps. Today, it's a much better picture. The Taliban are out of power. There is a nascent democratic government in place with a standing army and police force and because of the will of the Afghan people and support from the United States and so many other donors over the past five years, we see some good, good indicators of progress. The licit economy is estimated now at $8.8 .8 billion and a central bank with 32 branches. Despite all the negative press about poppy cultivation, which is negative, it should be negative, the illicit economy is growing much faster than the illicit economy in Afghanistan. Six million children are in school. Eighty percent of the population now has some access to health care. More than 4,200 kilometers of roads have been paved or repaired by the United States alone. The United States has rebuilt or repaired hundreds of schools and clinics. <coughs> And one thing I saw when I left Kabul on Friday uh, sort of spoke volumes about progress and Afghanistan, the government at least, looking forward. Sitting on the tarmac at the airport <coughs> was Russian Foreign Minister Ivanov's plane. There's a lot more to do, however, as Candace said. There's a growing insurgency in the south and the southeast. The poppy problem is worse than it's ever been. Still, fewer than 10 percent of the country has access to electricity. Maternal and infant mortality is still high. And although more children are in school, literacy, particularly in the rural areas and particularly among women, is very low. In this environment, with so much yet to do and security staring us in the face, how do we choose our priorities? We have a very close working relationship with the military, with the donor community and the Afghan government, and all three of them impact the makeup of our program. But some are more equal than others. So let me talk about that. To balance the needs of security and development, USAID works closely with the military and NATO to ensure that our programs are implemented in conflict areas, not after the conflict is over. We've got development advisors at each of the NATO regional commands, in Mazar, in Host, in Herat, and Kandahar, as well as at the ISAF headquarters in Kabul and at our base at Bagram. Those advisors provide development advice and information to the commanding officers. They try to ensure that military-funded reconstruction projects are as develop developmentally sound as possible and the projects are well coordinated with other donors in the central government. Is there room for improvement? Yes but there's been ter terrific progress in the four years that we've been at this. The strongest aspect of our coordination with the military comes from our staff in the field, the field program officers that Candace referred to that serve in the provincial reconstruction teams. They provide reconstruction assistance to expand the reach and enhance the legitimacy of the central government. We've got field program officers in many of the PRTs. I visited about half of them and they play a very valuable road, role, not just monitoring what we're doing in that province, which is a very important part of their job, because in many ways they are the eyes and ears for USAID staff that sometimes can't get out of Kabul. But they're also coordinating with the, with the military on development issues and helping the military d decide how to spend military reconstruction funds wisely. What do I mean by wisely? Generally, I mean sustainably. 
The USAID field officers also have a modest budget to implement small-scale community development projects in their provinces. The focus before, a couple of years ago, was on quick impact projects, mostly focused on local infrastructure. Now the program is much more encouraging, more meaningful community participation, identifying and implementing projects with the goal of strengthening ties between communities, traditional bodies like shuras, and local government officials and some of the development councils and committees that Candace referred to. We have to rely on our colleagues in the military to accomplish this goal. The PRTs provide food, housing, forest protection, and other resources for the field officers without which we couldn't operate. And even now, there are days when it's very hard to get out. Some of you will remember a story that appeared in the Washington Post last year that criticized us for our schools and clinics program. And I've been quoted several times as saying that what was very frustrating about that article for me is that the Washington Post had more access to our programs than we did. We're also increasing our coordination back here in Washington with state and defense th through the new office of the Director of Foreign Assistance over at the State Department and through a new office at USAID, the Office of Military Affairs. We've also sent military, we've also sent our advisors to UCOM and we will soon be sending an officer to the new AFRICOM. We're, we're looking for people to serve in PACOM as well. How has this cooperation with the military affected our priorities? One word, roads. The focus on paved and other kinds of permanent roads started as an effort to expand the reach of the U.S. coalition and Afghan militaries into conflict areas. But I don't need to tell this group, it also contributes greatly to governance, the ability of the elected leaders down at the local and provincial level to get out and talk to their constituencies, as well as economic development in the area. Every farmer will tell you it's great to replace poppy with new fruits and vegetables, but if I can't get them to market on a decent road, what's the point? Donors. Coordination with other donors takes many forms for the United States, from ad hoc sector coordination meetings to formal um, sector meetings chaired by the government under the new JCMB that Candace referred to. I spend a lot of time with colleagues from State and the Pentagon traveling around capitals in Europe, talking with other donors to be sure that our plans are sewn up in the capitals as well. Not that capitals ever try to micromanage from far away. By spending so much time coordinating with their other donors, they also influence our priorities. For example, our close work with the United Kingdom on counter-narcotics greatly influenced the decision to ramp up the U.S. effort in that area in the last two years. In particular, USAID coordinates closely with DFID and CETA, the Canadian Development Agency, on our alternative livelihoods programs in Helmand and Kandahar, where their troops run the PRTs. We also work closely with the Italians on justice sector reform to increase the capacity of the government of Afghanistan to arrest and prosecute Afghan criminals in an environment that respects the rule of law. Likewise, the other donors listen to us sometimes. That's why several other countries, Japan, Saudi Arabia, and the EU, are helping us build the Ring Road and several other key provincial roads. I save the most important interlocutor for last, the Afghan government. The key to success in Afghanistan, clearly, is working with the central, provincial, and local governments to ensure that they have the capacity to provide basic rule of law, governance, and social services throughout the country. Who did we learn that from? Them, the government of Afghanistan. They've committed themselves to building the requisite capacity and political will needed to meet these lofty goals through the Afghanistan Compact that was signed last year in London. And the United States is working hand in hand with them to attain these goals. Our two presidents agreed to form a strategic partnership to formalize an annual process for reviewing progress on certain agreed priorities in economic prosperity and governance. That's why I was in Kabul last week to chair, to co-chair the Economic Prosperity Working Group with the Deputy Minister of Finance. And the ANDS representatives were there as well, giving us a hard time. And those discussions gave us an opportunity to very candidly, there's no press in the room, this is just the United States government and the Afghan government talking very candidly about priorities, about problems, about roadblocks, finding solutions together. 
What did we hear from our Afghan colleagues? Capacity building remains number one. The priority to push <laughs> further prosperity, increase aid effectiveness, and build greater governance, particularly at the local level. Now, I've been busy in the last couple of weeks up on the Hill talking about the President's new supplemental request for 2007 to counter the insurgency in the South and the Southeast. What are those components? Roads. I told you where we got that idea. Mostly, at least it started with the military. Power. The government of Afghanistan and the military agree with us that we'll never win hearts and minds in the South if we can't bring electricity to Kandahar and Lashkargah. Rural development and alternative livelihoods. Where did we get that idea? The government again and other donors have convinced us that a comprehensive counter-narcotic strategy that focuses as much on alternative livelihoods as it does on eradication and interdiction is the only recipe for sustained battle against poppy cultivation. Capacity building at the local level. Again, the government of Afghanistan and the other donors have stressed to us the importance of capacity building for everything we do, <laughs> civilian and military. I wish I could say that we'd come up with all of, these, all of these priorities on our own. Maybe if we'd had enough time and the security situation was more benign, we would have come up with these priorities on our own. But the point is, for this discussion today, we didn't. And I'm proud of the fact that in 2007, five years after we started in Afghanistan, is that we are taking the time, and it does take time, to talk to the military, to talk to the other donors, and most important, to talk to all levels of the Afghan government to set our priorities much more than we did before. Thanks very much. Hi, right, thanks everybody for coming out this morning, and thanks uh, Michael and the Wilson Center for organizing this event. Um, every time I talk about Afghanistan, something happened the day or the day before that makes it seem uh, like it's particularly momentous time to speak about Afghanistan, and the sad reality is that you could pick most days, and that would be true. Um, I was struck as I walked in here uh, by a quote that I saw from Woodrow Wilson uh, that says, uh, it's kind of in the middle of the quote, but I think you'll get it, that we are chosen and prominently chosen to show the way to the nations of the world how they should walk in the paths of liberty. Um, and uh, it struck me that uh, in our pursuit of teaching the Afghans how to walk in the paths of liberty, we certainly didn't think or expect that we would be where we are today uh, five years ago. Um, in fact, before the bomb blast at Bagram last night, I actually read an article that said that the proposed meeting between Cheney and Karzai might not happen because there were some weather problems and both sides were too scared to drive the 30 miles. Uh, Cheney was at Bagram, Karzai was in the capital, and neither side was willing to take the risk of driving the 30 miles to see each other. Um, which to my mind says something pretty dramatic about, about where we are in Afghanistan today. And so uh, in order to get back to that point, I want to review uh, um, about whether we sort of got the broad strategic mix uh, of, of inputs right in Afghanistan and, and where we went wrong. And in order to do that, I'm going to talk about three things, the context, uh, commitment, uh, and our investment strategy. Uh, and before I do that, I just wanted to say that this book, uh, 21st Century Peace Operations, which is edited by uh, the amazing Bill Dirch, I'm sure some of you have seen the previous two volumes that he's done, has just come out this week. And it's a really great volume looking at recent peace operations. Uh, there's an Afghanistan chapter in there as well. And I left some, uh, there's forms out on the front table there if people are interested in ordering it. But it's a great overview of, of what we're talking about because so many of the, the situations uh, that are talked about in this book, the six different cases, 
Uh, they all sound very, very similar in, in certain specific ways. Um, I want to go to the question of context briefly. We, we've heard this, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly, but I, I think it's essential to understand. First of all, before Afghanistan went through these last 30 years or so um, of war and conflict, it was already one of the poorest, least developed nations in the world. Um, Afghanistan is resource scarce, it is landlocked, it is in a bad neighborhood, it is mountainous, and it is poverty stricken. And these factors are the factors that economists and political scientists tend to focus on as indicators of potential for growth and likelihood of conflict. And so Afghanistan has pretty fi five pretty serious checks against it starting out. Uh, it was rated, the 2004 Human Development Report that came out rated Afghanistan sixth uh, the, at, at, from the bottom of the pile in the world, just above some high performers in sub-Saharan Africa like Sierra Leone and Burkina Faso. Um, it has an under five infant mortality rate of 25 percent, or at least had it in 2004 as far as statistics would, <coughs> would allow one in every four children dying. Even more shocking in some ways, the maternal mortality rate, 1.6% uh, uh, or 1,600 per 100,000, but when you multiply that by the birth rate, that means that approximately 7 to 8% of Afghan women are dying in childbirth. Um, life expectancy lowest in the world at 44.5 years. Um, and uh, on the political score, six major regime changes uh, in the last 30 years, um, each accompanied by uh, tremendous violence, often lasting years at a time. And so it's very important uh, to keep in mind that when you're going into a place like Afghanistan, some of the challenges that we're going to face are virtually insurmountable, and the best strategy might not do you good. But that's not to say we should be excused uh, from having a good strategy. This is a picture of Durlaman Palace in the south of Kabul, um, which was destroyed in the Civil War of the 1990s. And I, I, I really love this picture because to me it's always very emblematic. It was originally built in the 1920s uh, to house the king, and then um, uh, it turned into a ministerial building. Um, and it still stands looking somewhat like this today. Um, Afghanistan really experienced about a 25-year project of the deconstruction and delegitimization of, a, of the state. And this was not an especially strong state to begin with. Um, but this systematic process created what was ultimately, uh, in 2001, a radical decentralization of Afghanistan. Politically, economically, uh, the country had literally broken apart all major sort of systems, whether they're road systems or justice systems, tax collection systems, anything that existed at all that looked like governance was all decentralized to the local level. Um, and the key concerns for a state building perspective would have been to provide security, um, to rebuild the legitimacy of the central government, and to provide public goods to the regions, to the people. Because most people in Afghanistan do not live in the capital and the urban areas, they live in the regions, they live in the rural areas. Um, and in many ways, we got this backwards. First of all, and most dramatically, I'll talk about this a little bit more, we failed to provide security throughout most of the country. Um, and second, rather than enforcing legitimacy at the center and providing public goods throughout the regions, we did the opposite. We enforced the local or regional legitimacy of leaders while at the same time providing public goods only to the center. <clears throat> In part, this does, in fact, have to do with our strategy. These are sort of well-worn quotes, but I'm just going to run through it quickly. I don't think our troops should be used for what's called nation building. This was, of course, uh, Governor George Bush in one of the presidential debates in October of 2000. This next quote, uh, we will stay until the mission is done. Uh, peace will be achieved by helping Afghanistan develop its own <laughs> stable government. We're working in the best traditions of George Marshall, uh, et cetera, et cetera, invoking the Marshall Plan. Uh, and this was only 18 months later. Now, that is a pretty dramatic shift uh, in rhetoric between 18 months. But unfortunately, I don't think that from the U.S. government perspective that rhetoric was yet, and I, and I do want to come to, I think, some dramatic improvements, but was yet met with the reality, 
Uh, we have this quote then from 2003. The United States Congress has stepped in to find nearly $300 million in humanitarian and reconstruction funds for Afghanistan after the Bush administration failed to request any money in the latest budget. Um, Frankly, when we went into Afghanistan, we had a very conflicted set of goals and a very conflicted set of priorities, particularly in the first two years. Uh, our fundamental goal and the resources dedicated to that goal were not to rebuild the state of Afghanistan and to create a stable democracy. They were to fight al-Qaeda and the Taliban, both worthy goals, although in my opinion need not have been mutually exclusive. <clears throat> This gentleman, I think, is, is a good face uh, for representing what I think is, uh, is certainly the first and greatest strategic error that we made in Afghanistan, uh, this sort of original sin of the Afghan conflict, um, which was the embrace of warlords who the U.S. government, State Department, uh, the United Nations, and others had spent the last two decades writing human rights reports about how bad a lot of these guys were. Um, and they became our chief allies in the war on terror. Um, there are reasons for this, um, but the importance is not so much uh, how the fight was fought in the first few months. It was really that between 2001 and 2003, the failure to expand the ISAF, uh, the failure to provide security outside of the country, essentially left for two years, I think the sort of two lost years in Afghanistan left gentlemen like Rashid Dostum uh, and Ismail Khan and Gul Aga to consolidate their hold not only militarily but over the economy and politics of the regions that they controlled. Uh, and, and I very much believe that post-conflict environments are very much like wet cement. Uh, you go in and you have an opportunity in which to shape and smooth that cement um, and then in a few years, forces are going to start to become entrenched. Political forces start to become entrenched. Economic forces start to become entrenched. And that's very much what we saw in 2001 and 2002 with the very unfortunate uh, um, result uh, that most of the country remained very insecure. Uh, and I don't mean insecure in a grand way that there were major battles going on, although that did happen in some areas, but insecure in the very local way where traders weren't safe where uh, the governing forces were, were more a source of predation um, than of protection. Here's an, uh, another well-worn chart. Uh, the aid levels for the first two years in Afghanistan compared to other major uh, interventions. Um, it's always worthwhile going back to this chart, particularly when you're looking at the first two years, because it's so dramatic that Afghanistan, among all of these, was seen as a critical national security priority to the U.S. government and the international community, and yet was so, under, it was so dramatically under-resourced in comparison. The second chart, again, this is looking at the number of peacekeepers per person and per square mile. Afghanistan is almost an order of magnitude less than the other contexts. Again, I'm only looking right now at the first two years. I'm going to shift now uh, to looking uh, a little bit more over the last five years. Um, this is a new graph that I put together. These numbers are not exactly always easy to come by. Um, but essentially what this is uh, in, in millions of dollars is the co overall cost of Operation Enduring Freedom compared with the cost of, of our foreign aid budget. Um, I'll come to the foreign aid line in a second because there is a dramatic increase there. Operation Enduring Freedom actually remarkably, even though troop levels have risen, um, has largely cost us about the same, which is about $17 billion a year. So as of this year, our engagement in Afghanistan has cumulatively cost about $110 billion. Not peanuts, particularly when you compare that to this first dot here. Like I said, a laser pointer. This first dot here is 1990 to 2000. That's a decade in one dot. That's $350 million, which represents the cumulative investment of the United States government in Afghanistan in the 1990s. Um, if there was ever a more dramatic demonstration of the costs of prevention, it, m it might be that. Um, but the problem with this line, which is a pretty dramatic one, is that the costs of Operation Enduring Freedom, and particularly the increased costs in troop levels over the last couple of years, have not been in response largely to the need to provide security throughout the country. It's been in response largely to the need to fight a resurgent insurgency which means that all of those dollars are still not going to providing security for the majority of Afghans. 
When we look at this uh, USA to Afghanistan, this is not AID, uh, as in the Agency for International Development, but overall foreign aid. Again, it's very tricky to parse these numbers because everybody kind of counts them differently. Um, but what you see here is a pretty dramatic thing. 2003, in the summer of 2003, the Pentagon came up with something that they called accelerating success. In other words, it was apparent that things were going pretty dramatically badly in Afghanistan. It took about a year to wind this up. Uh, but essentially, the U.S. government started to recognize for the first time that in, in terms of financing, um, that we were so far under what was needed uh, in order to do something about this. So one of the problems that I'm going to turn to in a second of looking at the division of priorities across sectors is that it doesn't really matter how you divide uh, the money if there's not that much to divide. <clears throat> So here's a, a, another graph about troop levels in Afghanistan. Again, total troop levels, it's dramatic. You look at the numbers in 2002, they start to rise in 2003, and then they go dramatically. Now, the shift here is that the US <coughs> troops that you see, which were non-ISAF, a lot of them were folded for the first time this year into ISAF. So ISAF kind of takes this dramatic, uh, this dramatic leap. Um, and the uh, non-U.S. ISAF forces also take a pretty considerable leap. So again, three or four years in, things aren't looking good, and we start to take thanks, uh, and we start to take uh, uh, measures uh, in terms of increasing troops and increasing the n amount of money. Now, this chart, um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the time to get all of the sectors in here, but I think that this chart shows something dramatic. These light blue lines are our security costs. That's mostly rebuilding the National Army and some to rebuild the National Police Forces. Now, the thing that's interesting about these numbers, in 2003, uh, some senior State Department officials um, had candy bars made and printed up that said Afghan National Army. Um, and they, were, they, they would sort of go to meetings with these candy bars joking that they were having to sell candy bars uh, like most American school children in order to raise uh, money uh, to support the Afghan National Army. You look at these levels of funding compared with 2006, somebody woke up. I mean, this is a 10 times the amount of funding. Obviously, the rhetoric that we needed to prepare the Afghans to take on their own security, unfortunately, initially was really not met um, by the need for funds in order to do that. And so the progress with the Afghan National Army, which has been a dramatic success story in certain ways, again, started too late. Counter-narcotics, same question. We start funding counter-narcotics when it becomes more and more apparent uh, that it's an enormous problem. Um, counter-narcotics is in many ways an enormous problem for Afghan security. But the problem is when you compare the counter-narcotics budget to the rest of the development budget, and in fairness, some of the counter-narcotics money does go towards development and does go towards things like alternative livelihoods. But when you compare that money to the rest of the development, what we're doing is instead of trying to support growth, we're, fight, we're, we're sort of backsliding and fighting a problem that has crept up on us. Um, when you compare that to the health and education budgets, uh, which are actually falling for the last three years, um, and that may change, but at least according to the statistics I have, have fallen in the last three years. Um, certainly, we don't think that we're further enough along in those areas to support a decrease in funding. Um, so let me just talk very briefly about the sectors, uh, and then I will wrap up with a comment. Um, I, I talked about the security forces, uh, the reconstruction money, again, We've done a tremendous job of trying to build this ring road in Afghanistan, but it's one road, and we've spent several hundred million dollars on it, and it's still not complete. Our assistance to Afghanistan in terms of delivering inputs at the citizen level, delivering a peace dividend, delivering something so that people will embrace the government, has still been problematic. Now, there were some important successes highlighted. Um, the program at the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, which is getting block grants out to villages to make their own decisions about development needs, has been, again, one of the most important successes. Um, it's a governance success and it's a development success. Uh, but it's a small one in comparison to the enormous need. Same thing with the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, the Ministry of Public Health came up with a very interesting and innovative strategy and has worked very hard to get that out to the provinces. The hallmarks of these efforts that have worked have been that a lot of energy was 
exercised in creating a competent core of people in Kabul, but then decentralizing all of the programming. And there aren't that many successes, but they all bear these same hallmarks. In other words, what you need in Kabul are a few good people who can do the work, which is a problem because human resources are dramatically uh, difficult to find in Afghanistan, <coughs> but that primarily the programming needs to be decentralized. Enormous gaps that have existed and continue to exist in our strategy, first of all, the justice sector. I take this personally because it's what I've worked on the most, um, but justice is one of the most important hallmarks of legitimacy for Afghans. If the government is unable to deliver justice, they will find others who will. And they, in fact, have found those others. The government's justice sector right now is so poorly resourced uh, that it is rated consistently over the past couple of years as the worst among a fairly bad uh, variety of sectors. And our resources that we're dedicating to that, particularly from the US government perspective, still remain excruciatingly low. The thing that Mark talked about, the development of human resources and civil service, we have been saying this since day one. There is no way that we can expect the Afghans to carry on and move forward unless they have their own competent human resources to rely on. And again, you look at the story of the Civil Service Commission, other efforts, they have been so dramatically under-resourced, not only in terms of money, but in terms of political attention and support to ensuring that they work. The final issue is this question of, of strategy and coordination. Uh, I think Candace laid out a very good model. There has been an enormous amount of thinking that has gone into this model about how the Afghan government can set priorities and integrate those into the Afghan government. All I can say is that it doesn't work in a lot of sectors. It looks good on paper and it is an important and well-meaning effort, but the reality is that donor competition and competition between as, as yet to be rationalized ministry in, ministries in, in Afghanistan, in other words, many of the ministries don't exactly know what their competency is and they still continue to compete over those competencies. And at the highest level, uh, at the cabinet level or at the presidential level, um, the policy apparatus still does not exist in order to, to coordinate those priorities. Uh, and as a result, it, it continues to really hamper um, our ability. Um, and, and then the final, and, and, and this is you know, one of those overarching enormous costs, um, is the question of political attention and our political attention. Um, you know, I sometimes think that uh, in 2002 we were looking at the wrong map of Afghanistan uh, because it, it was in fact a map of Iraq. Um, it's already been evident uh, in a number of books that have been written by high-level policymakers that as early as late 2001 and 2002, resources, whether they're military or financial, but also political attention began to shift dramatically away from Afghanistan. Um, and that was enormous, enormously costly. Um, and the, 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 the ending that I'll say um, is that, you know, the, the flowers and candy that we were promised in, a, in Iraq, uh, at least in Afghanistan, we got the flowers. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say something about sequencing too, but I'm out of time, so maybe we can uh, pick that up uh, in the uh, question and answer. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, lots of uh, insights, uh, information. Um, open it up to the floor. Uh, please be as succinct and clear in your questions and uh, um, perhaps target them if, if uh, appropriate. Um, I believe uh, Mark, go ahead, Mark. Uh, Mark Schneider, National Crisis Group. Uh, I think I want to thank all three of the presenters for, uh, for providing a, a very, um, I think, complete picture of the situation. You have a sense when you look at those charts that Alex laid up uh, on the screen that the, the real tragedy is that you, ca you can't flip them. And you can't show that in 2001, 2002, 2003, you had those levels of commitment that you're seeing now in 2006, 2005, both in terms of money and troops. I mean, clearly the decision was made to try and do it on the cheap and it clearly was the wrong decision. Um, having said that, I really, um, 
I guess I, I do have a question for Mark in terms of when you look at last year and you see the, I think it's the tripling of suicide bombers, no, the quadrupling of suicide bombers, doubling of roadside bombs, and the tripling of direct insurgent attacks, um, mostly but not only in the south and east. Um, how are you going to get control of that at this point unless there's a fundamental change in the security situation, in the relationship with Pakistan in, uh, in that area? That unless you deal with the security problems, all everything else, it seems to me, is on hold that you described yourself in terms of inability to really to get out there to do some of these things? That's one question. And the second question is a question of impunity. That is, when, um, when Alex talked about the warlords, uh, he didn't relate it directly to dealing with, with the narcotics problem. But the problem, it seems to us, uh, is that the failure at the top to demonstrate clearly from the from Kabul that it is unacceptable. You can't do both. You can't maintain your political power and political influence and still run drugs. And until that message changes by people who are dirty getting thrown out, you're not going to be successful with anything else in the counter-narcotic strategy. <clears throat> however well designed it is, however much it shifts as it should to expanding rural development and alternative livelihoods, but until you deal with the problem of impunity at the top, it seems to me that you're not going to be successful. I'll just stop there. Um, why don't we collect a few first? Um, if there are, I believe there's a gentleman in the back, please. I think we should collect until about 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Michael, I was interested in your first comments about uh, the two words of evidence and holistic. I don't think I've heard those in reference to policy before. I thought it was r rather insightful. Um, what, is, the, what is your name, please? Uh, Chuck Woolery, uh, World Hunger Education Service. Thank you. And, uh, uh, Alex, I was really impressed with your slides, and hopefully, I don't know if you could distribute those to the group or not, but I would like to see about getting a copy of those. Those are very telling. And question is to Mark. You know, I was heard a quote once that uh, you can always count on government uh, to do the right thing, uh, but only after exhausting all other possibilities. <laughs> and the question is, have we exhausted every other possibility, and are we now going to do the right thing? Okay, seeing no more hands at the, m well, all right, one more hand and uh, then. Just a very quick question. Um, uh, I'm Lynn Gallagher from Telecom Telematique, and um, we've been doing some work in the, the region on telecommunications. Um, could you give me a, a, a sense of the, uh, um, the potential for expansion of communications into rural areas and if there's uh, uh, the infrastructure there to uh, support that, the, so the human infrastructure? And is that for? Anyone who wants to answer it? Um, <coughs> perhaps uh, Mark or, or uh, Candace. Okay. All right, why don't we turn to the panel at this point. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Is that on? Go ahead, speak. It's all right? Okay. Um, operating in the south and the southeast. It's not really the east, it's the southeast where we're having uh, particular problems now. Um, what are we doing differently? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that the, the insurgency challenges our ability to get out and get work done. But if you compare what we're doing today in the south and the southeast with what we were doing down there a couple of, a year ago, we're doing a lot more now. Is it risky? Absolutely. Do we occasionally have to suspend activities? Absolutely. We were going full speed ahead on our work at the Kajiki Dam until recently. The, the British troops had driven the Taliban back, and we were all very excited about that, and we were mobilizing our work on the turbines and starting to work more on the road, and then we got hit again. So we pulled back, we take stock, we look at the security situation, and now we're going back in again. So it does involve, I'll admit, it does involve starting and stopping. But the good news is, that we've got the resources down there now dedicated to that part of the country more than we did in the past. The risk is, well, there are many risks, but one of the risks is that we don't forget the rest of the country. And this is an ongoing discussion that we have with the Congress, is that we don't put so many of our resources in the South and the Southeast that we imperil the rest of the country and give the bad guys an opportunity to take advantage of gaps in the rest of the country. 
So it's why we continue to keep other programs going, national programs going in the west, in the north, in the east. But the focus now clearly, and in fact the focus behind the supplemental request, the over $2 billion that the President has asked for this year just for economic assistance, is on the south and the southeast. Um, taking on impunity in, in, in the fight against counter-narcotics. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit out of my uh, lane on this one. Um, I, I'm desperately looking for somebody from state INL. If they're here, they're probably too chicken to identify themselves. <laughs> um, it, it's an issue, absolutely. I would say I would maintain it is getting better. I think President Karzai's comfort level with taking on some of the what you called warlords who are in positions of authority um, is growing. The fact that we now have an attorney general in the country and a chief justice of the Supreme Court who are very committed to prosecuting those that need to be prosecuted gives all of us hope. I, I agree with Alex that the justice sector needs a lot of work. One of our concerns clearly is that finding the bad guy, arresting the bad guy, then raises the question, where do we put them? Where are the, where are the courts? Where are the prosecutors? Where are the defense attorneys? Where are the prisons? We're working on it. Maybe we're behind, but it's certainly getting a lot more attention now. And again, part of the supplemental request includes significant additional funding for the justice sector. Are we going to do the right thing now? Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, Alex's slides are great, but there's a, there's a and, and I appreciated him, him being candid about some of the hidden explanations for some of the, some of the bars. We did get a lot of extra money for the Accelerating Success Program a couple of years ago. And one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we didn't get as much money last year is that the capacity of Afghan organizations and expatriate organizations to disperse and spend that money was strained, to say the least. And we had a lot of money in pipelines. It's hard to convince the United States Congress, OMB, you, taxpayers, to put a whole lot more money into Afghanistan when certain records show that there's already plenty of money there to be spent on some of these programs. So this is why, another reason why, capacity building is in, in everything we do is so important because as the numbers go up, and this year, inshallah, they will, we'll be, up, we'll be getting another $2 billion this year, our ability to get that money spent working with the Afghan government is getting better all the time. But it is still a tough road to hoe, folks. It is very hard to find competent Afghan contractors. It is very difficult to find competent Afghan NGOs. We're trying. We're building capacity with them all the time. We don't like the fact that we have to import and pay the costs of bringing in Indians and Turks and Pakistanis to do the work. But until the situation on the ground gets better, that's what we're going to have to do. Now, there, there was some comment about you know, the numbers for the amounts of money that we're spending on some of these sectors is very, very low. I just would urge you to keep in mind one of the reasons it's very, very low, particularly in programs where we're working directly with line ministries, is it's a risky business for the United States or any other donor to let go of the money right now. We're trying to build the capacities in those ministries to manage the money so that we don't have to keep hold of everything and do all the contracting and auditing and financial management ourselves. We'd like to turn the funds over to the line ministries, but you as taxpayers and the GAO and the Inspector General and the Congress aren't going to let us do that for a while. You shouldn't want us to do that for a while. So we have very small programs to test their capacity, let them learn as they go. But th that's one reason why those programs are so small. Final thing on telecommunications, I've never spent time in a country, and I spend a lot of time in Afghanistan, where everybody has a cell phone. In fact, one of the things that we discussed at the uh, strategic partnership meetings last week when we were talking about the financial sector is apparently very soon in Afghanistan, you're going to be able to 
um, carry out a financial transaction with your bank through your cell phone. Not bad. Any other comments on those questions? Yeah, I was just going to say something about, because uh, Mark mentioned the word impunity. Um, and uh, this gentleman, uh, who is one of the most prominent members of the Afghan parliament, uh, Mr. Sayaf, almost got elected, missed by about five votes, becoming the speaker of the Afghan parliament, um, is also the person against whom probably the most complete dossier of war crimes has been assembled, at least uh, the, the, uh, in terms of very high level figures. Um, and. You know, the impunity question, just to expand it beyond the drug question, I mean, it, it, essentially, uh, you know, there is an answer to impunity uh, in the minds of, of the Afghan leadership, which we're seeing uh, play out in Afghanistan over these last couple of weeks, which is amnesty. Um, essentially, the Afghan leaders, like Mr. Saif, have gotten together and decided that everybody who's done anything wrong in the last 30 years should just be excused of that. Uh, in aid of promoting national reconciliation. Um, I, and I think a number of other people, including a lot of Afghans who have suffered at, at the hands of people like Saif over the years, are not quite convinced uh, that the road to reconciliation and that the road to reestablishing citizen confidence in the concept of government um, is, is the path uh, of amnesty. Um, it, Essentially, since the very beginning, when some of the most dramatic war criminals were brought back into the fold, and since uh, con they continued to commit some very grave human rights abuses even after uh, our forces intervened in 2001, um, impunity ha has essentially been the norm. Uh, nobody, uh, with the very limited exception of one or two people, nobody with any real serious power uh, no matter how much we've known about them, how many bad things we've written about them in the past, um, has been asked to pay for this even in the slightest ways, in the sense that they couldn't serve in the government, they couldn't stand for election. Um, and so this, this sort of concept of impunity throughout the government, unfortunately, has not just been in counter-narcotics, it's pervaded the entire mission, and, and I think dramatically affected our chances of having an Afghan citizenry that believes that this government um, is really one that is, is uh, looking out for the best interests of Afghanistan citizens. I'm going to ask a follow-up question on that particular point, unless you wanted to. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, if, uh, a certain argument seems to be popping up in, the, in, in uh, observations about uh, not only Afghanistan but Iraq and, and the Palestinians, not to broaden this too much, uh, which, for example, when Cheney puts pressure on Mus Mus Musharraf, Musharraf um, to clamp down on uh, al-Qaeda havens and so on and uh, seal the border, et cetera, um, and this argument that somehow there was a failure to um, uh, deal with uh, the, uh, the the source of many of the of the problems, uh, at least locally, security problems as well as uh, b blocking development, um, cultivating poppies, and so on. Um, that somehow the leaders in the governments here, Afghanistan in this case, um, are, are not support are not demonstrating sufficient political will. Very vague term. Very vague concept. Um, and that somehow if they were simply to clamp down on these people and take their job more seriously in a sense, uh, we wouldn't have that problem. But I'm, I'm wondering whether the local dynamics in these uh, very weak states uh, makes uh, people like Karzai extremely dependent politically on certain bases of support. And this is a hypothesis and maybe I'm dead wrong and that's why I'm asking the question. Um, so that it's just not a matter of making a decision, uh, having the right mentality, uh, figuring out the concepts and the priorities better, but it's a matter of political survival for them. And, and it's somewhat unrealistic for the international community to, to harp on this, this argument. Um, especially if resources, uh, as seems to be, have presented here, uh, behind local development and behind the development of local security f forces, for example, or police, um, ha has been so minimal. I mean, if you can provide the resources in order to, in effect, one way or the other, psychologically, politically, socially, buy off uh, the, the opponents that you're trying to uh, sideline and, and buy in 
uh, support at the various local levels, then that becomes, uh, you know, a way perhaps to tackle this problem of impunity and so on, the, the, the warlord problem. But in the absence of doing that, aren't we facing in the nature of weak states in which inherently uh, political relationships, networks, uh, informal clan and other relationships are the dominant fact of, of life in the, in the politics of these countries? And um, so it's a little um, uh, glib uh, to, to somehow see it, and I know n none of you is necessarily saying this, but was this simply a conceptual oversight on both our part in terms of our priorities and somehow lack of political will, or is there something deeper in, in the nature of these weak states that, that basically is the source of the problem? Sort of a long question, but I wonder if, we could, uh, if, if that makes any sense to you. Anybody? <laughs> um, well, I, I think you know what just what was reported from Islamabad um, is some indication that the United States um, does raise questions like this. Um, I'm not going to go in, go into any details, but uh, I do do not think it is folly for the United States or any other government that is interested in Afghanistan's future to have discussions that you're describing with um, President Karzai. Um, we think progress has been made, but you have to remember, keep it, you have to keep it in context. There are pressures on the Afghan leadership, and there are a lot of um, avenues that we want him to be pursuing and his leadership to be pursuing at any one time going after warlords is one of them. Um, we think there has been progress. We think there has been progress particularly in the police sector. We think there has been progress um, on certain individuals. And as I said, we think there's been progress and the potential for more progress in terms of prosecutions with some new people that are at the Supreme Court and the Attorney General's office. Do we have a ways to go? Well, let me just say that we continue to have these kinds of discussions and all of our uh, NATO uh, partners have these discussions um, with the Afghan government, with the, with the government in Pakistan, with uh, you know, other governments in the region. Um, but I think when you look at it overall in the context, we do see progress. There are a lot of factors that are, that are confronting the leadership there. Um, so you know, I think you, it, it is certainly an issue, but I do think it is something where we should be engaged and we should not just say, this is, a, this is a difficult situation, so let's not put President Karzai on the spot and raise these issues with him. That's not our position. I, I was just going to respond briefly. I mean, I, 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 think, I think your um, analysis is right in the sense that it is enormously complex. And in any time when the United States is going to someone like President Karzai and saying, um, you know, take this guy out or we're going to take this guy out, it's obviously enormously complicated because the, these people control networks, they're immersed in local politics, they control people, they control arms. Uh, um, but that being said, you know, most of them have been chased out of the country by the Taliban. And so when you're talking about 2001 and what the potential was to actually change things, um, not only did we not take advantage of the fact that they had been so completely uh, disenfranchised for the most part, um, but we actually built them back up. I mean, they were our allies. We armed them, we funded them, and then continued to do so for two years. Let uh, some in. Yeah, but up until 2004, every weapons cache, and there were enormous weapons caches all over Afghanistan, every weapons cache that was found by an Afghan militia leader who was working together with the coalition was theirs to keep. Um, and so we sort of, as we started to talk about the DDR process, we were simultaneously doing enormous things to to, to rearm uh, these guys and refund them. I mean, it's a well-known fact, for instance, that Fahim, who's one of the guys from the north, his brother controls the, the fuel contracts to Bagram, which is worth uh, up to $100 million a year. So that kind of thing, um, it, it's not just a question of, of, of having said, okay, there's all these guys in place, let's go after them one by one and risk the stability of, of all of the regions. Uh, we had an opportunity that we missed 
Um, and, and so I think it's very important to differentiate between those things because today we are in a very different situation than we were in 2001. It is much harder and these guys are much more entrenched uh, and, and, and eff effectively our, our, our work in order to, to sideline these guys uh, now that they've also been legitimized by elections uh, ha is, has been made so much harder still. Well, I can just make a point as well. Um, if there is short-term utility to doing deals with local and provincial power brokers, we're certainly not seeing the benefits anytime soon. I think it was you, Mark, who said that President Karzai was too afraid to drive from Kabul to Bagram. Oh, where, where is his political... Sorry? It's actually out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So I, I think that any short-term utility is not really existent. Yes, sir. Could you comment on what the plans are going forward on the electricity issue and any lessons learned from your past experience? If you tell us who you are. Bob Archer, uh, USA. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Was that for me by any chance? Anyone in particular? Anyone, Anyone who wants to, if you want to start, Mark, go ahead, please. Um, uh, here, here's a, uh, a two-finger question as well, just okay? Just build on that quick. My name's Adam Sapper with MSI. Could you just add on the, the roads? You spoke to about roads a lot, and we're hearing a lot of interest in, in roads-type <coughs> programs and all the implications that can have economically, politically, socially, et cetera. So could you add the infrastructure side to that question? Thanks. Um, well, as, as I said, if, if you parse the components of the President's request for supplemental funding for FY 2007, those two sectors are number one and number two, roads and power. Um, we had a lengthy discussion in Kabul last week with the government on the power situation for Kabul in the north. We usually talk about the south. Um, so it is, it is clear that the problem is not just in the south, that there are concerns about enough electricity for Kabul in the north as well. Um, I'm not going to tell you what our plans are for solving it because we haven't, uh, we don't have a plan yet from the, for the, from the government of Afghanistan. One is due soon um, that we p will certainly take a, a serious look at. We have good resources in the supplemental request that we should be able to respond, um, at least in part. Um, to the perceived gap um, to be able to provide more electricity, particularly, as I said, to the people in Kabul. Um, so this is an emerging um, area for us of, of great interest. And what was really useful about these meetings last week is, and what really gave me um, a lot of hope and confidence in the process of this strategic partnership, is how candid and forceful the, the Afghan side was in putting this issue on the table. Um, and uh, we, we, we really applauded them for that to, to show that these talks really had some substance to them. It wasn't just reviewing progress and patting each other on the back. They had, um, they were candid enough to say, you know, we've got another problem that we need to discuss with you that we need your help. And we, and, and we appreciated their candor on that. On roads, um, and we could debate all day the merits of building a ring road and the and uh, the value that we think that brings to the country. Every time I go to Afghanistan, I'm shocked and amazed in a very good way at the commercial use to which the ring road is being put. One estimate I heard during these discussions last week is that they're now counting 12,000 trucks a day on the road between Kabul and Kandahar. Um, it looks like 95. Um, and uh, Clearly, we need to be concerned about maintenance because it's getting a lot more use than we imagined. But that's, that's good news. That's a good problem to have. Um, roads remain very important to us, but the shift is to roads in the south and the southeast, and the shift is to less really quality paved roads, double paved roads, and more to roads, maybe cobblestone roads or gravel roads that are more appropriate in, at a local level and roads that will, rec that will mean lots of jobs for lots of young people for a long time to come. I'd like to, uh, did you have a question, sir? Yes, yes go ahead, please. 
I'm Joel Wishingrad of World Media Reports, WMR News. What, uh, since we don't hear too much about Afghanistan, other than this report where Vice President Cheney uh, was possibly the target of an assassination attempt at Bagram Air Force Base, uh, we have outsourced apparently the, the work within Afghanistan to NATO. To what degree is that outsourcing working within the com country? Uh, do, they have the, do the Europeans have a better viewpoint, meaning a European viewpoint, to help the people, not just in the urban areas, but also the rural areas? I guess that's me again. Um, well, let me tell you, the United States remains the largest military force, of course, after the Afghan, the, the ANA forces. Um, yes, we've looked to our NATO allies to take up um, a larger share of the operation. And I must say, looking back at, at the discussions that we had a couple of years ago as we put these plans in place, we've been very impressed. Um, with the commitment of the Canadians and the UK and the Danes and small countries like Romania in Zabul um, to really take up the fight. And I dare say the Taliban's been impressed. Um, and we, we were very pleased. Um, the other thing that I think has been very, very hopeful and um, my, my uh, colleagues up here on the podium talked about it is is that all of us the Canadians the Brits the Americans the Danes the Romanians everybody gets this comprehensive approach um, and when I go and speak in capitals in Europe um, I don't spend a whole lot of time with the military I talk to parliamentarians about the how important it is to the United States and how important it should be to them that their bar charts start the, the levels of security assistance and economic assistance start getting a little bit closer. Um, and they get it as well. And they're helping teach us that, and we're helping to show them the benefits of that on the ground. I think, uh, I just want to say about the NATO, I, I, I think that it is uh, an interesting experiment, the fruits of which are not yet known. Uh, in many ways, it is very positive um, as far as a burden sharing exercise. It has actually led to an overall increase in the number of troops. Um, I think one of the very interesting things that, you know, depends on the week, but you read interesting articles comparing the Dutch approach to the British approach to the Canadian approach, and maybe from that soup uh, in southeast Afghanistan with these different, somewhat different approaches uh, to how they, they uh, approach the mixture of counterinsurgency and development. Um, how hard or soft they go, whether they negotiate or shoot their way in. Uh, um, we might actually learn something uh, about how to do things better. And so I think that that's interesting as well. Um, there were pretty grave fears on the part of a lot of Afghans uh, about this shift because uh, they felt that it was a downgrading of U.S. commitment. Um, and um, I don't think that that's evident, but certainly the perception seemed to be shared by the Afghans and by the Taliban, at least initially, who saw it as an opportunity to attack uh, a somewhat weaker, uh, you know, uh, um, place uh, on the armor um, because they thought that the, that the uh, NATO countries would be weaker. And in fact, they're right in certain respects. I mean, we see that Romano Prodi's government almost collapsed in part because he couldn't get continued support. Uh, to hold troops there. The Germans and the French, uh, who are not an insignificant part of NATO, continue to refuse to have their troops, uh, their NATO troops, be involved in the counterinsurgency campaign. Um, and the question of NATO uh, is, uh, involvement in Afghanistan is also interesting from a longer term strategic pr perspective uh, for the alliance. Um, because if, uh, if NATO fails in Afghanistan, then it's going to truly question the foundations of the purpose. Uh, of the organization at the moment. Um, so that speaks well of the need and their need to not let it fail. Um, but at the same time, it's not apparent that some of those members won't start getting picked off and leaving the country in a year or two uh, because of people's frustration, concern about casualties, and so on. Um, so, so in my opinion, it, it's very much still a, a question that is, it is up for debate about whether this is ultimately going to have led to greater support uh, 
for Afghanistan internationally or not? Just to finish up, uh, well, <laughs> people are starting to wake up here. Um, uh, okay, let's keep going for a few more minutes anyway. Um, yes, sir, and yes, sir, and then that's probably where we'll have to end it. Two more questions. Go ahead. Ayub Khaurin, and I'm a journalist with uh, Voice of America. Uh, first, let me uh, say that uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Tahir's uh, presentation, uh, the majority of Pashtun would love uh, to see your presentation. And uh, with so much uh, the opening of media in Afghanistan still, there hasn't been a single person who has been uh, who has ever talked about the, the, the crimes of uh, uh, the, the pictures that you showed, uh, those them, who is a well-known, but there has been a single article or a single, um, at least that's not happening in Afghanistan because still they have, that shows how much f uh, fear the, the, the people have in there uh, from these people. Um, and the Pashtuns would, would love, uh, th that, that was the very, in the very beginning when Karzai came into, uh, people uh, uh, accepted and it kind of, uh, they, they waited and waited and waited, but how, how long? Uh, they, they're fed up uh, with these people have seeing uh, them close to Karzai and having the real power. And, uh, uh, my uh, my question uh, recently, I've been talking with the the governors, uh, uh, and and one of them, the governor of uh, Khost, uh, he has a uh, 20 years experience working with international community, uh, has been uh, with the humanitarian organizations, and wh when he was appointed, uh, based on this. Uh, work experience. He was very happy and the people were looking forward uh, that he will bring in projects and money. But uh, in one of my talk shows, radio talk shows for Afghanistan, he said that it has been six months that uh, there hasn't been a single USAID project in that, in that province. And most of the money is going to Rosgan, the, the three red zone provinces. And his, I think, I think he was right by saying that maybe there's a policy of to wait and to see that the conditions get so terrible, <laughs> t uh, terrible or worse uh, as it is in Helmand, and then there will be money and projects from USAID. The only thing that he has been able to get, in spite of all his experience and connections, is salaries for three staff members that work with him. So th uh, this is. Uh, this was one of the realities, and I think the question goes to, again, to the USAID. Uh, uh, I must thing. have. Uh, one, one, one thing, most importantly, he said that the, the relationship or the ownership uh, issue, which is the ISAF and the USAID, it is undermining the credibility and the legitimacy of the central government. Uh, and it's difficult for them to extend their writ and tell the people that they are, uh, the government is actually providing services. I must have visited a different host province last summer when I visited a number of USAID projects. In fact, when we visited a community center, um, my visit probably wasn't very welcome because there was a, an IED to welcome me, but uh, um, that's why I remember the day in particular. Um, I'm sure it wasn't against me. I'm a very likable fellow. Um, <laughs> one, one of the strategies, frankly, that works in the countries that we work in is to complain that you're not getting any resources. Um, so I applaud the governor for that strategy. Um, he should probably keep it up. It, uh, the fact is that host is a little bit off of, um, as you call it, the red zone map. Um, as I said before, and I'll admit it and I'll say it again, we are focusing more on the areas where the insurgency is particularly hot. Um, that said, we have plenty of programs in host province, what I will do when I get back to my office is send a little note to the AID people in the PRT and to the military commander of our PRT asking them to please go talk to the governor and review with him again everything that is going on in his province. Um, can I, can yes, I? go ahead. Um, with regards to host, I think that the Ministry of Finance has commenced uh, a pilot project in several provinces, one of which is host, uh, which is asking the provincial governors to budget and thereby they will receive uh, fiscal resources if, if they do it well. Um, decentralization is a concern, so is corruption. I'm not saying your governor is corrupt, but it is an issue that uh, the central government, in addition to the international community, must consider. 
one more question, and then I think we'll have to conclude. Thank you. <clears throat> David Turnbull, uh, Department of State and not INL. Um, this question is for uh, Candace. <laughs> <laughs> Candace and Mark. Um, Candace, you mentioned in your presentation declining levels of support for the Karzai government. And Mark, you did a, a very good job outlining the major successes um, that the U.S. and donor communities have made over the last five years in Afghanistan. And I, I'm wondering uh, that both of you could maybe address what seems to be a disconnect in the strategic communications. Is the government of Afghanistan getting its message out to the people about these successes? Um, are they hearing that story? Or are they hearing, you know, the ongoing insurgency? the IEDs, is that what's reaching the people? And same question really for the donor communities and the international, the allied community as well. Which story is getting out there and how can it be told better? I think the government of Afghanistan has recognized that its policy of strategic communications has been um, less than optimal and that this is certainly now a priority for the central government to uh, to get those good stories out. It's not all doom and gloom in Afghanistan. and. Uh, part of the PAG process, uh, one working group of PAG, the policy action group in the South, uh, is to develop uh, strategic communications policies to further this agenda. When, when, uh, when I was there last week, we attended a meeting of the new uh, communications, I don't remember what it was called, N333, 3C or something. And uh, um, I was very impressed that it, a very good discussion from our side, the donors, the military, of course the Afghan government really agreeing on and agreeing to meet every week to agree on messaging for that week to get out to the governors, to get out to the district leaders, to get out to the police officials, to be able to talk about successes in their parts of the country. Because you're absolutely right, it has been a problem. But look, this is a problem that development faces around the world. When I was in Ottawa a couple of weeks ago, um, we heard about the Canadian efforts to embed journalists at CAF, at the, at the Kandahar Air, Air Base, and their PRT in Kandahar to try to get Canadian journalists. Afghanistan is a big story in Canada. It's page one almost every day. And to try to get their journalists out to cover the reconstruction programs. and. I won't name names, but the woman that made this presentation up in Ottawa said, this is a great success. You should all try to mirror it. Well, then I'm in Kabul, and I'm hearing the Canadian journalists don't come go out and cover the reconstruction stuff. And if there's no kinetic activities that day, they just stay at CAF. It's very hard to get them out, even when there's not another story to cover <coughs> on the military side. It's very hard to get them out to cover what we're doing. It's the same problem we have with our journalists. I expressed some dismay earlier about the, the Washington Post had more access to our projects than I do. And guess what? They weren't out covering something good about our schools and clinics. So this is a continuing problem, not just for the government of Afghanistan, but for the donors as well. And that's why we're all encouraged by what Candace has been talking about, that this policy action group is in place to focus on the South and the Southeast and to put together communications messages and to make sure that key stakeholders and officials in the government have the messaging, are trained on how to use it, and do use it. One of the points that I made, and that we really, I really do have to run, was, hey folks, let's not just stop the discussion when we agree on what the talking points are going to be. Let's then go listen in the village and hear what the police chief actually said. Thank you all for very stimulating and informative presentations.